in our community call, uh, 201 Lessons on Messaging uh, from the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness Care. Um, I'm Christopher, and I'm a project coordinator for the Conversation Project. And uh, the first thing we'll do is uh, just go over some tips for WebEx um, in case you're new to the platform um, and while other people are still joining. Uh, so if you want to chat to everyone, there's a feature on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, you can see chat. Uh, you might need to open up the little caret symbol. Um, if you open that, you can chat in to all participants uh, so that everyone can see a response. And if you do have um, any questions, uh, feel free, if it's about like, technical things, just to chat to host. And then you can get a hold of me and I can help you. Uh, there's also the raise your hand tool. Um, so if you're interested in speaking your question, uh, you can raise your hand and we can unmute your um, phone line um, and you can ask your question. All right, so we're going to get started with a quick icebreaker. Um, so if you could chat into the box on the right, um, how did you learn about this call today? And be sure to chat to all participants uh, so that everyone can see your responses. All right, a lot of people saying email and the newsletter. I imagine most of you are on our um, monthly newsletter, um, but if you're not, um, I encourage you to sign up. You'll get reminders of these calls and other information on, on how to uh, promote advanced care planning. All right, welcome everyone and thank you for chatting in. Uh, next, we like to see where people are calling in from. Uh, so if you go to the top left-hand side of your screen, uh, there's an arrow button, um, and you can click on that. And then once you click on the arrow, then just click on the screen, and it will pop up with your name, and you can click on where you're located. Uh, Kate, Ann, and I are all in the greater New England area, uh, but great to see people calling in from across the country. All right, thank you everyone for joining. So we just want to do some quick introductions of our team. Um, so if you've been to one of these calls before, you're used to seeing uh, Patty Webster and Naomi Fedna. Uh, they're both off on vacation this week. So we have Kate DeBartolo, who's our director, and myself, Christopher, who's a project coordinator uh, for the Conversation Project. Uh, good afternoon, Kate. And we will actually- Thank you, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just want to do one more um, update just on our um, future calls. So today we're in July. Our next one is in August, on a month, in a month. Um, and we'll be talking about um, Conversation Sabbath, which happens every fall, um, inviting clergy and religious leaders um, to preach and teach on the Conversation Project. Uh, so now I'll pass it over uh, to Kate to give us some updates um, on um, on all the work going on in the TCP world. Great, thank you so much, Christopher. And if you just hand me control, I can move my slides along. It is lovely to chat with so many of you guys today. It's been a while since I was on one of these calls and I always love seeing who shows up and hearing what you've been up to. And I especially appreciate those of you joining during the string of vacation weeks in July. Uh, if you were on earlier, you heard that I've got birds chirping in the background. So I've got my summer windows open. I'm calling in from Cape Cod in a hybrid vacation working week. Um, and I'm excited to share a couple updates with you before we hear from Anna about the content that you that we're all excited to hear about. So there's been no downtime for us this summer. and just wanted to share a couple of new things. One is a blog series that we've kicked off with the actress Tembi Loft. So um, she is a wonderful actress and author who's just written a book um, about the loss of her husband and kind of the experience there. And it's one of these amazing books that has gotten wonderful reviews across different um, newspapers, book groups. Uh, you know, you, it takes place in Italy. There's a lot of food, love, loss, laughter. So we've been able to connect with her and have her answer some questions and um, hope that people get a chance to check that out. We also have a 
one pager that we've kind of put together that's um, and a helpful website landing page for anybody who's working to engage various professional services. So we've often seen that to be financial, legal, insurance professionals. Those have been some of the most common. But it's really great tips from firms who've helped introduce this content about advanced care planning with their clients and their staff. So we've got a bunch of tips, tricks, and hard-won lessons there. And similarly, we've released a case study from some great work at Fidelity. So if you're trying to engage some of these groups, this case could be helpful to read and to share on how, you know, how to show that a large institution has approached this work. Um, and then finally, as an update, we've received feedback from many of you that your state doesn't always use the term healthcare proxy. That's kind of a ubiquitous term, or a lot of people use that term, but it's not everywhere. And a lot of states do use the word healthcare agent. So we have created a version on our website for those who use the term agent. It's the exact same text otherwise, but there's a version that uses the term proxy throughout, and it's a term that uses the, the a, a version that uses the term agent. Those are the two that we're planning on having for now. So if you have a state that has one random word that isn't used elsewhere, I'm afraid that we're not going to have lots of other versions, uh, but wanted to call that out for, for those of you. Um, I just want to check the chat out, yes, we'll be sending out the um, links afterwards that doesn't work through WebEx that you're able to click through it. Um, one other reminder is that we have our quarterly survey still up. So for those of you who've been with us for a while, you know that you probably get emails from Patty Webster once a quarter asking you to fill out a little bit of information about just what you've been up to in the last couple of months whether you've had activities or you've reached people or you've shared information on social media or distributed starter kits, anything about your activity um, in the field. These, this survey is super helpful for us, and so we've got it open through the end of next week. Even if you sometimes don't have activities to report on, we love learning about your organization or we'll always have a few extra questions for getting your feedback. So this has been really helpful. You know, what we learn in this survey really helps us design our programming for you, so just wanted to ask you to keep an eye out for that. And then one of the other updates we have, we have a call series that just kicked off yesterday about some of this conversation ready work. You've probably heard us talk, especially in a previous call um, this year, about the work of what healthcare systems can do to be quote unquote conversation ready. If we do all this work to get the general public having conversations, knowing what they want, how can those systems be ready to receive, record, and respect those wishes? So we just kicked off that webinar yesterday. Um, it, you can still sign up. This one does have a fee for it, but there are scholarships available. And so if that's something that you're interested in joining, I just wanted to call that out to you. We also have a free white paper on some of the content as well as a clinician toolkit for going through four different cases about how to talk to patients, how to introduce this in cases that progress as an illness progresses. Um, and there's also a recent podcast on this content that's a little under 30 minutes. So there's just some great content right now around some of that health system work, and we'll be sure that we send out some of the notes about it. So with that, I'm going to share a little bit of background of kind of what this call is intended to be about today. Um, then we're going to turn it over to Anna to share about the great work that's been going on in Massachusetts, and we really want to leave time for questions and answers. We're going to be talking a lot about messaging today, and it will be really exciting to hear what some new evidence is showing us and surveys that we've done, but also to get your feedback on how this message is resonating with people that you're working with. So as a little bit of background, many of you might be familiar with our Getting Started Guide for Communities. We ask groups 10 questions to think about. And one of them, you know, we kind of go through who you want to reach, how do you want to support them. But one of them is how do you want to reach people? What kind of um, framing is important? How, where are you going to reach them? You know, how are you going to find that target audience? And what are some of the activities that could help engage them? And so I would actually love for a moment if people would type into chat. Chris Purvis was talking about conversation status as an example. Some people write it to their local newspapers. If people would type in kind of the messaging that you have been using or messengers that you found to be particularly helpful. I know there's some communities that have really popular university mascots and they've engaged the mascot or the Boston Red Sox put something up for National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, it'd be interesting to hear what kind of messaging has worked well in your community or the messengers that you've had. Um, that gives a little framing of, of where we are. But I also just want to turn this over to Anna. And I was talking to Christopher about how to describe Anna and what your title is as it relates to this 
the serious illness work in Massachusetts, and all I came up with was maven guru extraordinaire, the person who's kind of making this all work, and would love for you, Anna, to kind of help share with people what it's been going on in Massachusetts, what we've learned, and ways that that would be helpful for those who are on the line all over the country. This isn't just Massachusetts specific, so would love for you to right. take it away. Um, well, that is a very kind introduction, Kate. Can everybody hear me? I'm always like distrustful of technology when you're like, staring at a big picture of yourself on a screen. But, um, uh, I think and I was we'll like, give first you off, control <laughs> so that you can advance your own. Oh yes, slides. I can advance my own slides. Thank you so yes, much. So um, good. Now we can stop looking at me, and now I can stop looking at me. So um, I would have to say it's like I don't know if, if Kate and you know Sir Harriet and previous had ever talked to you about the origins of the Massachusetts Coalition, but it really was the coming together of three organizations. Ariadne Labs, which, you know, sort of started uh, in this work, uh, really focused on clinician training, sort of improve their serious illness conversations, uh, communication skills. So Ariadne Labs, the Conversation Project, and Blue Cross the Shield of Massachusetts. And so these three organizations sort of have had each been doing a variety of different work um, related to advanced care planning, palliative care, serious illness, and kind of recognize that Massachusetts is in many ways a very special place. We all feel, um, you know, grateful to be able to live and work here, especially in healthcare. And that there was an opportunity to kind of bring together not just these three organizations, but many, many other organizations that were working in Massachusetts um, uh, on these issues. And I would say that the um, the, the coalition launched in 2016, and, you know, we've had a series of convenings at the John F. Kennedy Library, which is one of our big, beautiful public spaces, um, and we, you know, shared a lot of the work we were doing, kind of uh, identified opportunities where we could collaborate on things. For example, our four medical schools are working together to try to improve the curriculum of undergraduate medical students when they leave to have a sort of a higher baseline training and exposure in serious illness communication skills. So sort of opportunities like that, but, but something that cut across um, something that cut across all of these member meetings, those are sort of smaller ones and our public ones, was this sort of struggle with, um, with language uh, and with messaging and with trying to have something that both um, provides a, a unifying less, uh, set of messages that sort of span across the healthy and the sick and a unifying set of messages that work with all the different sort of communities and tools and sort of historical practices that we all sort of have. And this launched this messaging research project that I'm really excited to share with you guys today that kind of kicked off formally last October, but it really grew out of these kind of you know, working sessions that we had with our, you know, 110 plus members at this point to understand where the, the sort of Massachusetts Coalition could provide um, value in and over above the work that we do as individual organizations. Um, and we were fortunate enough to have the Cambia Foundation which is the sort of Campy Health Solutions is the parent company overarching the, the four regions plans out west sort of co-fund with us. And through that partnership with, with Cambia, this really took on a much more nationally representative um, flavor, sort of recognizing as we were kind of doing the baseline research that even though Massachusetts is a special place when it comes to this issue, we're actually, there's lots of variation among people within Massachusetts. It's actually pretty similar to other states. There's lots of different people. When it comes to this topic, no, no single state seems to actually be that different at the state level when it comes to people's understandings, perceptions, um, beliefs, attitudes, and experiences with advanced care planning, um, you know, advanced health, serious illness, and at the end of life. So with that as a little bit of a preamble, I'm going to go to our next slide, which is like far too many words, but the whole idea is we partnered with really, really smart people who actually had worked with the conversation um, project before, a woman named Zamala Arenas and her um, company, Floetic. And she has a long history in uh, public health communication, public health research. So from tobacco cessation programs to seatbelt campaigns, um, she did a lot of, was you know, quite involved in, in some of the work around marriage equality and sort of that, that messaging. Partner with them to design a sort of staged research project that would help us develop these unifying messages that could be applicable, applicable across settings and across places um, for use within individual organizations could adapt it, but also potentially the baseline for something that could be flavors like a national campaign. So it's a combination of quantitative and qualitative to both understand, uh, you know, our, our people's experiences and attitudes at a high level and then develop and test messaging to, to find ones that will be most effective in promoting engagement in the advanced care planning process. And while we had hoped, by the way, to rename advanced care planning, we, um, we didn't make it up. Now, I know I talk fast. Uh, but if anybody, um, I just saw a little arrow pause, but, but, but I am going to be monitoring the chat and hopefully I, um, Chris Rowe will sort of jump in and remind me if I keep on going on, but please do, uh, um, uh, to the extent possible, kind of, uh, you know, go, go along. 
and I'll try to answer questions on the way, but also leave it to discussion um, at the end. This is Kate. We'll definitely help you mind the chat. Yes. This will be recorded for people who want to go back to. So if you talk fast, there's a lot of good content to get through. So always got it. All right, off she goes. So so the first uh, the first place we go to is um, is, is segmentation. And so the real question is, what, why do you segment? This is sort of a classic market research term, which is the idea if you take your population, usually in market research you're thinking of who you want to sell things to, but you take your population and you do a deeper dive in trying to cluster them into the smallest set of meaningfully uh, distinct buckets of people, you'll have a better understanding both of who you might target among those, how to speak to each of those different groups, and then what's actually going to work all the way across that, um, all the way across those segments. So, you know, previously, um, it, it, one of the things that we were always trying to solve for was that, you know, if you, if you develop tests and then if you develop messaging and then sort of test it at the high level, you wouldn't really understand um, if it really didn't work for some people and really did work for other people because that would be sort of buried in the averages. So our kind of hope was that by segmenting people into these meaningful buckets of sort of clusters in terms of their experiences and attitudes and beliefs around advanced care planning, we'd be better able to develop and test messaging. All right, so we get to our next slide, which is, this is just a, the methodological overview of the nationally representative 3,000 person survey that we did. It was 2,500 people um, nationally and then another 500 to oversample to Massachusetts to confirm for ourselves as sort of a safeguard that Massachusetts really was similar to the rest of the country, which indeed it was, um, to provide the, the, the number of people that we were to run very sophisticated statistics in order to cluster people into these five consumer segments. Um, and there's a, so, so they sort of, the, the first distinction between the five segments is there's sort of the two action taker segments and the three non-action taker segments. And action takers were primarily design, um, delineated by the, like all of these people having both a written document that names the healthcare decision maker, proxy, agent, surrogate, whatever, um, as well as having another document, which also could be part of the same document as we know, um, something that documented their wishes. Now this is not to say that we think these are the two most important steps. It's just that people who had done both of those things were clearly different than the people who hadn't. Um, and you can see that here, 100% of these people had, had, had documented these two documents, and almost 90%, more than 90% had spoken to loved ones, and a lot of them had spoken to their doctors too. When you look at the non-action takers, and there's sort of three different flavors of them, uh, very few had written documents, only sort of 4 to 15 percent, um, not very many, so about half had conversation with loved ones, but very few had conversation with doctors. They're just quite different, even these very high-level statistics. And then as you go on, you start realizing really other interesting things about them. Um, in that, uh, you know, for example, here's some of the things that, that stuck out. There's actually a, a huge chart pack that we haven't published yet with a lot of these differences. But, for example, the, the worried action takers, um, the worried action takers, that sort of first bucket, they tended to be our sort of younger, um, uh, there's a younger one of the more diverse populations, but they were the most worried about a bunch of different elements of, of, serious, of, of a future serious illness. Whereas uh, you sort of have our three sort of worried segments, um, the, the sort of, uh, and you have our two kind of unworried segments. And those sort of stuck out across different ways we asked about these worries. Um, and if you look at the next slide, um, this also tended to be a pretty strong, the extent to which if they had, if they'd been caring for, sort of saw a loved one dying, the extent to which they saw their loved one's um, wishes being followed, that also seemed to have, you know, some, some significant predictive value in just sort of clumping these people into their different, um, different buckets. Uh, and then the last one I'm going to call out is just sort of, these are among our non-action takers, and I know these are sort of difficult to interpret when you're just looking at these bars. But the idea is that the, the three different non-action taker buckets had different kind of profiles about why they really hadn't engaged in advanced care planning. Um, our uh, defiant independence, which is sort of this middle, uh, the middle color, really their, their biggest reason was just, I know that my, my spouse is going to know. It, it's fine. Like, I don't need this. I don't need to engage because my loved one will know what to do. Um, that sort of darkest blue, that first bar, those are our disengaged warriors. They are really um, some of our youngest, uh, sort of like lower income, low education, lower education uh, uh, group of, of folks. And they were just actually sort of cited every single reason in the book. And a lot of it just sort of came away with being sort of like, I just don't even know where to start. Like they were very overwhelmed um, and sort of didn't know where to sort of start with. And then our, our self-reliant skeptics, that lightest blue bar, for them it was a, a little bit the other thing, but again, sort of similar with that they tended to be a little bit older and married. So we're sort of saying my loved one will know, but they weren't quite sure. 
So this is a this is just sort of a summary, and again, there's a lot more content, and I know I'm going by it really slow, but this is sort of my um, a roll up of these five consumer segments: our worried action takers, youngest, most um, most educated, most diverse, um, high trust and high regard for the healthcare system. But what really sticks out about this group is both a significant proportion of them identified as someone with a disability, about 44%, and about 80% of them had cared for a, an incapacitated loved one. They had to make decisions for someone else. So these are these people that had this recent experience were younger and have taken action because a lot of the times they saw it not go very well. Second is our self-assured action taker is a sort of summary you would, you would um, uh, think about as your sort of classic, you know, retired, uh, you know, middle to middle upper income kind of white couple. This is disproportionately white. Uh, confident about managing their health and health care, navigating the system, and have few worries about a future serious illness, and have sort of checked advanced care planning off their box and probably haven't actually thought about it that much. Um, and our next uh, segment, the disengaged warriors, so again, that's about a third of the population, our largest segment. This is our youngest, most diverse, um, lowest education and income. Uh, and, and even though they were our youngest, they're the, they had the lowest self-reported health status. So they were the least likely to say that they were in very good or excellent health. A lot of them had seen their loved one's wishes not honored, and they have many worries about their future serious illness and just don't know where to start when it comes to advanced care planning. Our defined independents are sort of mostly older, 45 plus. I think of these as a slightly younger version of the self-assured action takers, and they really just feel confident about their health and health care and just don't think they need this. Um, they've seen a lot of, they, if, if they have seen loved ones die, it, it's much more likely to have gone well and in, in accordance with their wishes. And lastly are our self-reliant skeptics, and I think of these often as the disengaged warriors grown up. So they have that, they stick out in a lot of ways, and some of that is their lowest trust of doctors in the healthcare system. Again, like the disengaged warriors, they have poor healthcare management skills and navigation. They feel very unconfident in navigating um, the healthcare system and managing their own health. But unlike the disengaged warriors, who probably had fewer experiences in the sort of decades that follow as they've had more experiences with the healthcare system, they've grown deeply distrustful of it. Uh, okay, so those are our segments, and we'll have a little session at the end where we can kind of talk about, you know, who you are. I can tell you who I am, by the way. I'm a dis defined independent. Keep that for now. But but really, the whole point of it is. Um, uh, Anna, can I uh, just interrupt you for really? a second? Um, there are a couple of people. Uh, someone just messaged that um, they are following along with the PDF slides, but they don't not log into WebEx. So if periodically you could just uh, kind of hmm. let people know what slide you're on, then um, people. But I don't know. Is are they the same numbers? They should be, or if you just kind of talk about just briefly every once in a while what's on the so slide. So I was just on the five consumer segment slide in my slide number that I'm seeing, slide number 24. Thanks. You can go ahead. Okay. So, so one of the questions that we actually got asked a lot, and we've had um, uh, as we've gone through this process, especially when revealing the sort of segments is, the sort of like where is – X population, and that could either be uh, it could be a racial or ethnic minority, it could be a person with disabilities, it could be a person with um, serious behavioral health issues, or other sort of serious illnesses. And the, I think that the, the the biggest takeaways as we've answered those questions is first of all, like there are not huge differences between the, the segments. Um, you know, uh, this is a nationally representative survey. Um, uh, you know, Caucasian white people are the the largest race in America, and each of those segments that white people was the race. There wasn't one segment where it was like disproportionately people of color or disproportionately people who were sick. Uh, there really there was a couple of places where it really sticked out, but these were more sort of skews. So, for example, as I mentioned, the self-assured action takers were disproportionately white. Um, anxious action takers were disproportionately people who self-identified with a person of, of, as, as having a disability. Uh, but these are not the demographic characters that actually drove the segments. Those were really um, – the segments themselves were really driven by people's experiences as a caregiver, people's experiences of with, with advanced care planning and trust in the healthcare system personality. And those uh, – so, it was, so for, for example, a person who is an, an African-American anxious action taker is more similar to other anxious action takers than they are to an African-American who would be in a different segment. Okay, so I'm now on to slide uh, 27. So slide 27, and I'm going to have to channel Zamawa, who is our messaging research uh, partner in this, channel Zamawa a little bit sort of saying, this, this quantitative study, this analysis of, you know, this 3,000-person survey and the segmentation is really the foundational baseline so that you can develop uh, an advanced your planning social norms marketing kind of platform. And the idea here is that you define your product, 
uh, you, you understand the price, so this is the, the price of engaging in this behavior, which tends to be sort of, in, in our case of advanced care planning inertia, just thinking people will know or not having enough time to worry about or just not really want to engage in a scary topic. The place, sort of like how you're going to reach people with messaging, and then the actual message itself is that last bucket, the actual message, creative, language, and visual identity, any of those other things that go along with it. So this is slide 28, and it's a, the formatting didn't quite work out, but it's called a message map. Uh, again, a sort of a marketing technique, which is first of all, you come up with this umbrella message. It's a universal aspirational value and vision. And then these sort of other ones, you have your supporting messages that are all different sort of flavors that you can use in different environments. And those are supported by proof points that then um, kind of reinforce that reason. So again, umbrella message goes over everything. There can be multiple different supporting messages. And then each of those is supported by additional proof points. So you end up with a pretty big body of language that can be, that can be used in different settings. So how we created and tested messaging was through um, an online community that was together for four weeks. These were 150 people uh, together interacting daily over a four-week period with different you know, exercises, quizzes, games, sort of homework assignments that they would come back with. And then at different sort of junctures along that, we were sort of you know, very focused testing of different elements. And so I'm going to skip ahead. So this is where we started testing the um, creating the umbrella campaign. So I'm on now slide 31. At the beginning, we tested, you know, pretty early on in, the, in that session, tested these three shared value statements. And these three shared value statements sort of came up through all of the conversations we'd had with our stakeholders here in Massachusetts and a, like a larger and growing group of folks that were engaged in this project nationally, sort of trying to sort of say like, you know, why would I engage in, um, in, in advanced care planning from a sort of an aspirational, positive way? And this is sort of what came out. I want to have power to make my own life choices. I want to live a good quality of life my whole life. And I want the, the care that treats me as a whole person, not just a disease. So we tested those pretty early on. And pretty much people have really liked all of them, which is maybe not surprising. And this is how they sort of thought about it. Like everybody wants to live a good quality of life, but it was this idea of control and power over these decisions was what was going to make that happen. People reacted positively to things about, you know, talking about what matters to them and having a good day. And it was actually very difficult. You had to keep on coming back to the language and reminding them that we weren't necessarily talking about those specific life-sustaining treatment options like DNRs, feeding tubes, um, and ventilators, all that sort of stuff. And, that, and we'll see this again. The idea of family and loved ones can be a loaded topic for some, an excuse for others. You know, some people saying, I'm not doing this because my spouse will know, and other people saying they're not doing this because they don't have family or loved ones to talk about it with. So then we, uh, given the, the initial feedback from those sort of some of those early test results, other, other of the language experiments, the creative team designed three different campaigns. These are, these are supposed to be the foundation of that umbrella message that can, you know, go across, unify across settings. Um, and they put sort of a visual identity, they have a look and a feel, kind of like a poster. And then people were sort of looked through each of them, and I'm going to go through them sort of slowly. And you're going to see these are just drafts for testing purposes, why they have that big red draft on them. They went through um, this sort of idea of the good day is good talk campaign, the what's best for me campaign, and anyone who's read Being Mortal will sort of recognize this idea of a chocolate ice cream and football. As long as I can eat chocolate ice cream and watch football, you know, that's enough quality of life for me. Um, and then last was this idea of, you know, I am the conversation planner, dress starter, you know, leader. So we were testing these different versions. People looked at them and they had a highlighting tool to highlight bits they liked, they didn't like, particular language, things about the images. Um, and there was really an incredibly clear winner uh, across all of the segments, which was this whole idea of the good day to start with a good talk campaign. People liked it was warm and cheerful, it was sort of relatable, clear, simple language, straightforward, easy to remember taglines. They liked the, the pictures of people together. So what's best for me ranked second. A lot of it was it was just so hard to understand this combination of soft sheets and family time and serious on. It's a lot of mental leaps for people to take. The people who did understand the mental leaps liked that. But the people who, um, who but most people really didn't. You'll see that in another sort of PowerPoint. And um, get in the conversation sort of lack, what ranked last. And, but a lot of the, the feedback was because there was only a single person in the photo and it really should be about at least two. So you'll see these are the rankings here, and again, I'm sorry these bar charts are small, but if you see on the, the sort of first, uh, the, the dark blue in, this, uh, in the, the left-hand set of slides is the, the most favored, right? It, and that is the, the Good Talk campaign by segment. You've seen every single segment, people like the Good Day start with a Good Talk campaign the best. Um, and then if you look at the least appealing segment campaign on the other side, 
maybe I should have my arrow, Christopher, I should learn how to use it. There you go. Um, the get in the conversation was the one that people liked most, like most least, but it was a little bit more equivocal. So, um, all right, so what comes next? I'm now on slide 40, going into slide 41. So that's the sort of uh, lessons learned from the, the campaign testing. And what's gonna happen now is we're, we're taking all of this information, by the way, and doing a next iteration of these campaigns for testing with a whole new round of people who will be kind of naive, uh, so they won't know what it's about. Because one of the big questions was, how will people even know this is about advanced care planning, serious, you know, like um, end of life conversations. So, but the same time the team also did a lot of work trying to get to uh, this kind of language toolbox, that message map that I told you about. So we have these, the umbrella campaign, which is sort of expressed in those posters with the, with the you know, unifying taglines and bits of, of pieces of information that would come out of there. Um, and then we have our, uh, the, the reasons and then the proof points. So this is where they're coming up with that other section of the message map. So again, they sort of take these highlighting tools that I'm on slide 42. Uh, all the people in the online communities, these 150 people would look at these this language and highlight what they liked and what they didn't like. And um, you'd see this is sort of, I'm on slide 43, this is in sort of what the output looks like, is that the, if you look at these word clouds, the ones that people really liked would, would um, show up darker, the things that people really didn't like show up darker in the words that didn't resonate side. And here's a couple of takeaways. You know, not surprising, people always appreciate simple, direct, straightforward language and are put off by sort of marketing ease. They can kind of smell Smell when you're trying to sugarcoat things pretty quick. Um, word choices matter. I'm on slide 45. So at one point, a lot of uh, folks who are in advanced care planning almost view it through the lens of a right, a healthcare right. And that actually, we heard from clinicians prior to this testing with consumers that that was, um, they were worried about that term because it felt like you're putting people in an adversarial moment. And the same thing actually occurred when we tested it with consumers. They felt the word right makes you feel like defensive and like you're arguing for something. Um, Conversations can sound daunting while a good talk sounds more approachable, which is not to say I use, still use conversations all the time, but from a, from a campaign like what you might put on the side of a bus, if you're trying to draw people in to sort of lower the fear of any of these, a good talk seemed like it was more approachable than a conversation, it's like the conversation. I know ironic that we're talking about this from the Conversation Project community webinar. Um, other things like honest conversation as opposed to uh, open, just trying to use language that is as least judgmental as possible. Uh, so, so this is how, this is, and this is where stuff gets really, really interesting, which is where you take all these different, the, the different concepts I sort of showed back on slide 41, and you crosswalk what people, what different types of people liked and didn't like. And this conversation clarifies, this whole idea, this is really about control. It's like we can't control everything, but we can um, empower our loved ones to sort of give them a, a pathway to make decisions and, you know, things, talking about what we can't control actually can give us a sense of control in a, in a world where, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. This whole idea of conversations clarify, of like taking control uh, through the things that you can by writing things down, talking to people, resonated across all segments. You can see all those segments on the side. Similarly, this whole concept of we can have a say in our care. We know our be ourselves best. We're, you know, we're, doctors might be doctors, but we are the experts in us. Um, the more we talk and more we demand that they listen to who we are as people, the better care we can get. These two sort of like supporting, these two reasons uh, were the most um, favorite among all. And the size of the bullets, we were those really big bulbs are the ones who like resonated the most. So caring means about learning, um, caring means learning about them. This worked for, um, not surprisingly, the action takers. So these are people who have, our, these are the ones who've already documented their wishes and their, their surrogates or their decision makers, proxies, agents. And now they're sort of interested in, in trying to understand how they could better serve other loved ones in their life. Um, but this didn't work for a disengaged warrior. This is our most likely segment to say, I don't have loved ones to speak to. I am estranged from my family. And so we recommend um, you know, using that judiciously for folks where you've got, you, you know that you have an engaged environment and maybe you're asking them to take the next step. But we don't, um, there's no need to wonder, this is this whole idea of, uh, there's no need to wonder, we'll sort of go back to slide 41. There's no need to wonder, you know, the future is full of unknown, but you know, you can get clarity and, and figure out, it provides peace of mind. This is the whole idea of, of providing peace of mind. Didn't turn out to work that well with most people. Um, 
And then this whole idea of, again, love means speaking up, and the sort of that's the shorthand in some of our ways for uh, is this is a gift that we give to other people. If we do, if we do this, uh, if we do advanced care planning, it is a gift that we're giving to our loved ones and family members so that um, it's an act of love and kindness so they won't be burdened. So even though you heard that a lot, when it came to expressing that actually in all of these written statements, and even though I keep on going back to slide 41, those are just the headlines. There was, you know, sort of 10 or so proof points underneath each one of those. It didn't, it didn't work as well across all segments. It was really quite clear that the conversations clarify and we can have a say in our care. Those were the concepts that resonated most. So the team took, uh, the team took back all the feedback from these 150 people and tweaked the language, came up with the sort of most final, uh, final versions. And in the appendix to this slide deck, by the way, you can have much more like the full sets of language. These are mostly just the headlines. But this is, uh, this is essentially that message map from the beginning, this idea of, you know, a good day tomorrow starts with good talk today. This is the sort of tagline, and these will be sort of truncated if you would put, if you're putting them on, you know, creative executions like posters or social media. Um, here's our umbrella message. The reasons why, because conversations clarify, they can help us control things we can't otherwise control. And we can have a say in our care. We can demand that our healthcare providers know us and give us what we want, and that this is a good way to help our, our family members advocate for us too. Not convinced these are these additional proof points, and you have the full conversations at the end. So, um, so I guess this is where I'm going to stop, and I know I, uh, I think I should get to start, you know, entering contests for fastest talker in the universe. I'm sure I would win. It would be my side income for many years to come. But I just kind of wanted to pause to say if anyone wanted to chat in, and I'm going to go back before um, uh, to sort of say, it's like, why don't we just start, I'm going to start us back up with the segments of people and just sort of talk about um, kind of getting ourselves back into those mindsets of those five consumer segments and just asking for your reactions. Like, you know, do you recognize yourself? Do you recognize the people you work with, your parents, your families, other people in terms of the, the communities that you have worked with over the years in, in terms of engaging in advanced care planning? Do these segments resonate to you? Thank you so much, Anna. And we'll ask people they can type into chat or you can raise your hand if you want to be unmuted. Um, I know I loved hearing about these, and, and maybe you can share a little bit more about why you consider yourself a defined independent. I love knowing <laughs> that the demographics that we often hear about, that idea of kind of like, well, where are people who have X condition or right. this race or this religion that it was really representative across all of it? So that was a huge takeaway for me. Yeah, I, I will share why am I a defiant independent. I guess for for me, I sort of, I joke, and the, the head of palliative care at one of our big hospitals here is now a good friend of mine. And I always joke that my advanced directive is Vicki Jackson's cell phone number. Um, and that's like, I mean, it is sort of my comical answer, but at the end of the day, it's sort of, um, I do have a healthcare proxy, uh, and that is something we always sort of, uh, but, but it's sort of, I kind of recognize that what I want out of an advanced directive is people to, to understand me as opposed to thinking that I want my, my sort of to document wishes because I don't think those, those circumstances will sort of happen into the future. So I'm kind of a defined independent, and I hear this, frankly, when I do sessions within Blue Cross and other communities, sort of, if I, if I write it down, how do I know it actually goes anywhere, it'll do anything, anyone will find it? So I'm a defined independent, maybe not for the reason that is most prominent for this category, which is that my spouse will know. Mine is that it feels so unlikely that if I write something down or sort of do that, that A, that situation described would happen, and that B, even if it did, that the people who needed that in, access that information would be able to, and it would be useful in that moment, which is why, you know, we do a lot of work in the state government about, you know, trying to improve our MULCH program and maybe update an email. But, but that's why I feel like I fall into that category. It's just, um, and, I, and I sort of have a long way, but I've become changed in many ways through the process of working on this and understanding the ways that I think the language where we encourage people to advance, engage in advanced care planning is increasingly about the language to help people understand how to demand better care and, and harmonizing those I think has been just a huge eye-opening experience for me. I see Michelle says that she's often asked students to tell me where they think the patient is in the stages of change yeah. model and that this feels like a way better way of addressing it. So that's an interesting idea, Michelle, that maybe this is a, these segments are something you could introduce to students or um, people on your team to help them think of, of patients or people in the practice in a different way. 
Yeah, and I would say we actually did do, because Zamala, I mean, the, the, the researchers behind this, like, are steeped in that behavior change model of, you know, contemplation, pre-contemplation. Uh, and so we did that, because one of the questions that also comes up in this work is, you know, which segment should you start with? Where is there the greatest opportunity? Um, and is there one that we should focus on if the exclusion potentially of others, if we're trying to, um, you know, kind of target resources? Uh, um, and I think the, the answer is that when you looked at that behavior change stage, there was a variety of behavior change stages in all of them. And it wasn't that there was one uh, segment that you'd be like, oh, they're, you know, they're not worth um, engaging. And I would also say when you think about the action takers that have already done something, there's two things to keep in mind. One thing we sort of know from having tried to drill down this is that people can say that they've done an advanced directive or a, or a you know, healthcare proxy, but whether they've really talked about what matters to them, what quality of life, look like, life looks like, how to really give people the true guidance that's gonna help them in the face of both serious illness and at the end of life, this is a way to sort of make sure they've asked, if you're sort of, I'm gonna scroll through, by the way, back to that, um, that umbrella campaign statement, and this is a really clever trick that you wouldn't notice unless you were looking for it. Uh, here, if you became serious and real, would the people who matter most really know what matters most to you? They did that on purpose to sort of plant the seed of doubt to, for people who said, oh, my spouse will know. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, it's funny because we all think, it, you know, how hard can it be to come up with a, with a statement? But almost every single one of those words was chosen incredibly carefully to address all of these reasons why people said they weren't engaging, or sort of here's, and we don't have loved ones, we have people who matter most. So there's a lot of careful selection that went into some of this language that reflects the different segments' reactions to a lot of the different, you know, campaigns and language we put up in front of them. Um, but I'm going to go back to the segments because I love the segments too. Um, there's a question in the chat saying, did your research look at specific industry professionals and if they feel more or less comfortable engaging in the conversation like well No, companies? this is a totally, this was a completely consumer, um, consumer side. So these were people, uh, uh, people were triggered into this. We never asked about what they do for a living. We asked a lot of things about them, uh, but we didn't actually ask if they, if the people themselves were, um, uh, you know, wealth professionals or clinicians or things like that. This is like a completely just like a supposed to be a population representative sort of, con you know, consumer survey. I would say, um, did you, we've done that in the past though, and not in this particular one because we weren't trying to figure out who they most wanted to talk to. We were first trying to figure out what language to use. And again, you could argue different language will be better in different settings, but our hope is that everyone starts talking about things in a relatively similar way. Um, so no, we didn't, I think we did, gosh, I'm trying to remember. We asked at some point during the qualitative, but I don't think, you know, when you do focus group, this is basically like, you know, mega focus group work. Uh, I don't think it actually came out to be very, very different uh, in terms of what, what channels they would expect to um, be most receptive to these communications coming from. I think, Anna, this is Kate, I think, um, I love the findings uh, moving away from loved one in some right. ways with conversation project needs to take our own medicine on that one and some of the technical language, but that idea of those who matter most know what yeah. matters most, that's a really easy to comprehend concept. Yeah. I also think it's interesting that among those five segments, there's room for movement in all of them that you're totally. saying it's not like we should only focus on one group, but so, you know, the defined independence, but everybody has some room for movement. And I remember hearing from Zamawa that one thing that came out is that people are really open to learning from their peers on this. Yeah. You know, it doesn't yeah. just have to be Michelle Obama having a conversation with <laughs> her mom. It could be all of us who are on the line right now, 85 people on the line, the work that we're doing in communities and engaging people one-on-one -on -one or in small community events yeah. and people sharing their stories. That's actually a lot of what causes people to take action. So that was really yeah. exciting to hear as well. Yeah, and I think that the, and I know, and I, I'm, I'm sort of like I'm looking ahead of my slides and what else am I supposed to cover, but um, I, um, I'm just going to sort of skip ahead to slide 50. This is going to be what, one of my examples of how how we 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 are and hope this this kind of work is used because sort of you know Kate, you were saying oh it's great that there's 
um, opportunity for movement in any segment, which is which is really optimistic because you know if you have an audience of people, you're not like scrolling through and being like, aha, segment one. Oh, I think you are a segment four. I mean, this this is really about mass communications and really understanding what works in different audiences at a pretty high level. Um, and we'll all, I think, as we heard from a lot of clinicians who were like, I totally recognize all of my patients in these people. Um, but still, it, it's more about those sort of communications. And I would say, so what you have in front of you is. Um, is a web page that we actually use for our own Blue Cross Associates, all about how promoting advanced care planning, if they scrolled down, you'd see we link to the Conversation Project tools, and there's another um, Massachusetts-based organization that does a lot of work with, um, called Honoring Choices, which we partner with, so the actual kind of healthcare proxy form and uh, um, other things that are that are um, legally recognized in Massachusetts, and as well as CAKE, which is an online advanced care planning kind of platform. So, but it took like, ages to write this website because the language felt so precarious and you don't want to be too pushy and it felt like everyone felt really nervous that it was an employer doing this. And I would just sort of say it took just like absolutely ages to write this and even when it does, it still feels a little bit um, abstract and not that colorful and it was just hard. And I've written letters from our CEO, Andrew Dreyfus, to all of our associates to sort of say, you know, take a survey and attend some sessions. And it was painstaking because for all of those sort of things, wanting to strike that right balance with not scaring people, um, being transparent about what it was, trying to articulate the value of doing this for people who might be sort of dubious or put off. And when with this language toolbox, like rewriting this whole page, like that whole top introduction part of this page, literally took seven minutes. And it's not super different, but it's just all of this language that, you know, you can, we can just pick and lift in ways that made it really, really easy to get straight to the point, not talk around things, and, and really articulate directly why people should do this, and then link them to the resource, like the bottom resource section is at the same. And we've already heard folks, and I know Kate was sort of saying you're taking your own medicine and thinking about people who matter. We've already heard like a, um, a hospital is sort of thinking of, they do some uh, sort of serious illness conversation, like, oh, I like the way you phrase that question better. We're gonna change our conversation guide into to sort of capture the way you phrase um, the if you become seriously ill with the people who matter most. You know, it's so, so, like sort of stealing those, and that's the whole point, stealing this language in whatever way makes sense, because as people continue to hear it talked about in similar ways, it will ultimately continue to have a synergistic effect in promoting people's understanding of why to do this. That's great, thank you. There was a question from Joel asking about that of, are you further developing the messaging of the website that you have here and doing any testing on it? Yeah, so this was like, we're actually waiting. Um, remember I said, and I'm gonna go back, and I'm sorry I'm giving everybody like whiplash going through all the different things. So remember I said they're doing new versions of these. Based on this, they're sort of kind of, so we're waiting until the final final comes out and those aren't gonna be until kind of like October. Uh, in order to do, and like not enough people at Blue Cross, like as Blue Cross Associates, like use the website for us to, uh, to sort of be able to actually use user click throughs, but we're, we're kind of thinking through that. So what they're really testing new versions of is those kind of campaign, the, 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 the logo, the good days, the sort of, you know, the subhead, what matters most if you became seriously ill, tell who matters most, that turned out to not be enough, um, like they're sort of trying to give more focused calls to action. So they're working on all of that. We're not doing, my page on slide for you. So as soon as those come out, we will obviously do one, but I, I don't think we have enough traffic on the Blue Cross internal associates page. We do have an external public page that again, I'm waiting to update based on when this final language comes out. And then it could be really interesting because we do, um, again, link to all of those tools and it'll be interesting to see what people click through to, but um, that's also kind of buried and not promoted. But so the answer is kind of in terms of, you know, the multivariate testing um, of of the the internal Blue Cross page is just we don't have the analytics to really see any differences. We're yeah, testing these really focused somebody people. saying that they love the after look and what a great way to get the message out. I'm sure there's going to be questions from people. Maybe this will be part of what you want to cover in these final minutes. So, what can people in the call today take from these slides? They'll see some of the messaging that's worked. What do you recommend that people start to take? What will be coming out? What do you see as next steps for folks on the line? Yeah, or so, a couple of other things to cover as well. I would say, no, I have nothing else to cover. So I would say, you know, for anybody who really likes, I know I love the after too, right? It was so easy. I got a cute logo. I stole that. So at the end of October, there will be a package of materials that include 
photos everyone can use that will be of like like a different set of photos that everyone can use and they will represent you know different um, ages and racial and ethnic groups they will have you will have logos that you can steal with this sort of so I, I took that good days good talk and just sort of stuck it on there as well as all this tagline language the, the 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 actual messaging and I'm going to go this is the appendix right now 50 slide 53 54 and 55 this is this is done this is final so if you want to whatever is on these pages is is validated it is tested it is ready to use and I am using it already like anytime I have to write a email to community health center leaders Kate where um, Kate and I were working um, uh, with community health centers here in Massachusetts to try to sort of understand what language to use. Um, I actually go back to this right now. This is this is ready for the road. In terms of waiting for things like that will look like this, that maybe sort of sample social media posts or anything, and and people can use this and put in their own websites. They, you know, the posters will be able to sort of say go here to learn more. Anyone can put in whatever here they want. Uh, so it's. Um, so they will be sort of free for everyone to use, and that's what you're waiting for. But this language here, when you are looking at any of the communications you put out, the newsletters you put out, the way that you describe information sessions, look at some of this language, especially what I'm showing you here on slide 53, and see if any of these say what you're saying already, just maybe a little better. That's perfect. That's, you know, that's kind of the whole goal of these calls and pulling people together is that we want to just push out helpful content to people who are reaching the masses. You know, that's what our survey is about that we were talking about at the beginning. The folks on this line are the ones reaching more people than any of us are. And so for you to have this messaging and use it as it's helpful to, to engage different audiences, we hope that you'll pick it up. And would love feedback from you on whether this feels helpful. Yeah. It, it's not meant to, I, I want to clarify too, it's not meant to say you must change your language. No. You have no. to adopt this here. You, you know, hey, person who's been doing this for 20 years, change everything you're doing. It's more to think through if there's people that you've been struggling to reach or you're trying to refresh some of your work, here's some language that we've um, we've vetted across the country and, and have had some some strong brains behind. Uh, yes, exactly. We, then I, I, all I want is for people to use it. If you don't use it, fine. But if you do, it's just validating all like the, you know, the sort of money and effort and we're just trying to give everybody, I heard a really great example is someone just said it's the sharper tool in the shed um, for everyone to use and because we're all kind of engaging in this right now in our various different ways and it was designed to be able to plug and play into pretty much any circumstance where people are currently doing this work. And Mary Lou, I just wanted to say, I just copied down your email address and I will write to you when we get off the call. Oh, great. It looks like a lot of people are in agreement that this is super helpful for them and good timing. They're going to share it to, you know, their marketing department. I think that's always the, the hope. And um, it sounds to me uh, like it's fine when people use the messaging with their own designs or their own images or marketing. Absolutely. That's good. That's the whole idea, too, of this kind of umbrella message. We hope that nationally this kind of message gets out to the masses. And if we all have similar supporting messages, then that just helps clarify when somebody talks to their sister in Iowa and their brother in California that they're kind of starting to get some of the same message that they're hearing. Yep. So why don't we pause and see um, if there's questions people have, ways that you think you might use this, if there's people that you've chatted with that you think this kind of messaging does help. I really like um, this idea of conversations clarify is so simple to me and really does that idea of kind of planting a little seed of doubt while also kind of helping them feel like this is something you can do is good. Um, and I was also interested in you know, when you were talking about some of those demographics, just that idea of like, I don't even know where to start. And that's our goal here is to then be able to point people if we're going to use this messaging. The idea is then to say, and we're here to help or whoever you are locally. Yeah. Here, I'm here. I'll help you go through this. People don't have to be experts on everything advanced care planning. Um, but we're here to help. Would love to hear from others with kind of questions that are still coming up for you or ways you think you might use this or feedback that you have for us. I was grateful to see that this started as something that was going to be Massachusetts, and I love that it's now national in scope. I think that was a really great decision, yep. um, kind of forward thinking, so that nobody feels that they have to recreate this study in their region. Yeah, we were, it was just an amazing um, 
uh, I guess it was, it was thanks to obviously you guys at the Conversation Project and to, to Peggy to be able to kind of do that because it turns out this is this is one of those things. It's just a really human. It's based on our human experience that seems to transcend geography in lots of ways. Um, so there's a question here. Do we need to give credit to the Mass Coalition if we um, want to use specific language? You absolutely do not. We would love you to tell us about it just because the more people we can understand who are using this in different ways, and it also means that when we come out with the campaign material that's sort of like the final version in October, we can get it to you. Um, uh, yes, I have more detailed charts of the demographics within each category. Those, like, I just have, they haven't been cleaned to be published yet, but they're almost ready to go. Those will be available on the, um, those will be available on the coalition website soon. And when, when, when they're up there, I can let Kate and Kate know, and you guys can, I'll, I'll make sure to ask Kate to sort of tell everybody about them. But yes, they are available. They're just not, like, literally copy edited. Um. Somebody says here, I think the you know you aspect is something I'd love to incorporate across the board. I like totally. That, um, I, that is one of my favorite parts of all of it, which is just sort of empowering people to remember that they might be sitting in front of doctors, but the biggest expert in that room is they themselves about themselves. I remember hearing somebody say, you've made every other major life choice <laughs> in your life. <laughs> Why would you leave this one up to chance? You know, getting people in that kind of power piece. I think um, one thing that also stands out to me is how much none of this is wildly new information. No. I, I no. like your sharpest tool in the shed, but like yeah. it's just a nicer, crisper, more vernacular. Like it just works for people a little bit more. So it seems like it's gone uh, just a tighter version of what we've all been doing. Yeah, and our hope is again like that that ultimately this whole let let's see it does end up with this kind of good days, good talk sort of campaign that, that people can use some of those visuals and will again just reinforce those messages. So people will be seeing it and hearing it in the same ways in different locations and different places. So even though it's not as you said, this isn't rocket science, right? We all sort of knew in the backs of our minds what that language was, but just like the focus of all of us using slightly the same language in slightly the same ways and focusing on what those are will over time be incredibly sort of powerful because people keep on hearing it in the same way. So it just reduces the confusion and sort of I think adds to the the, the confusion itself is a is a barrier to activation. Yep. So I want to make sure that we have time for some of the final slides. So as Christopher switches to those, I'll just let people know that as more of this collateral and materials come out in the fall, we'll be sure to share that. I think the other benefit is that there will be beautiful images and posters and things that for those with small budgets, you don't have to create all of that yourself. So we'll be able to share it. Um, and I'm glad to see the comment from Cheryl. Uh, it's powerful to work on language. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christopher, Christopher to um, end up the call for us. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, Anna. Um, we just want to give a few more reminders um, for people who are doing work um, in the community. So as many of you know, um, we have a bunch of community engagement resources, and just like this work, um, it's perfectly free for you to download and adapt to your local setting. Um, so you can get um, you can get it all through our website. Um, we have a new Get Involved page, and then um, there's different resources based on if you're in healthcare, faith, or community. Um, so please go there. There's plenty of resources, um, case studies, et cetera, and it's all um, available for you to download and use. Uh, also on that page is our Conversation Champions map. Um, and so we recently launched this about a year ago now. Um, so people can connect with each other and see who's working on similar things in their area. Um, so again, on the Get Involved page, um, you can just scroll down and there's a map of the people working across the country and across the world. Um, so we encourage you to add your pin to the map if you haven't already, um, and feel free to reach out to anyone directly on the map. Um, the idea is that we can kind of create a learning community and um, you can reach out to each other and learn from each other, uh, just like these calls. Uh, one last thing is we're continuing with our um, campaign to uh, ask for letters um, that you can write to your loved ones. Um, and if, so if you'd like to write one, please email it to us um, at conversationproject at IHI.org. Um, and uh, we'll be sharing some of those on social media and on our website. Uh, these are just some, um, some quotes that we've gotten from letters submitted so far. And in the final minute, just want to remind you about the next call in a month. Um, you can sign up on our website. 
And finally, um, when we close this WebEx, you'll be directed to a survey. Um, we really appreciate uh, all your feedback on how useful the session was um, and on anything else you'd want to learn more. And please keep connected with us um, through our newsletters and through our social media. And finally, thanks to um, the Hartford Foundation and Cambia Foundation uh, for supporting this work. And thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for your work that you do uh, to promote advanced care planning. And big Everyone. thanks to Anna for the heroic, yeah, you do, you're like the micro machines guy who could talk really, really fast in the commercials, but you got through a tremendous amount of content in a way that's really helpful for people. So thank you so much. Yeah, and please, Kate, share my email, because I would, um, I am like impassioned that this is only going to be as good as people keeping on using it. So I've written down a couple of email addresses. You'll hear from me after I get up this call, but like, just call me up. I'm here. This is the point. Please use it. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, I see there's a question in the chat just before I hang up. First time user to this conversation. <laughs> um, yes, we will send out the slides and recording to everybody who joined the call. So um, you'll have access to that, and you can reach out to us about better ways to keep, keep connected and keep working with us. Glad to have you join us today. Thanks, everyone.